All right, welcome back. So our next speaker is Chris Neugebauer. He is an Android developer and board member of Linux Australia, and the talk is called Test Driven Repair. Please welcome him. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Yeah, uh, my name is Chris. I've hidden my Twitter handle on the slide there. Uh, you may feel free to heckle me or, or tell me where I'm wrong uh, online. I will try not to respond to you during the talk. Um, so I, I'm here to talk to you today about uh, what happens when you forget to write tests on your, um, on your code. And that's, that's possibly putting it kind of politely. It's when you completely do not write tests on your code, and then you suddenly discover at some point later on uh, during the, uh, the development of your project, potentially when your code has hit prod, uh, that you actually needed to write tests at some point. Um, so, um, for those of you who don't know my, my professional background, uh, I end up hitting quite a lot of different uh, types of technologies. Um, I was assigned to hit a, a 3,000 line piece of enterprise Java code that I'd never read before um, last October or thereabouts. And it was a bit lacking in the, in the testing department. Um, and that's when I wrote this abstract. I was maybe six months ago at this point. And I, th I thought I, I had good ideas about, about how to, to get through uh, solutions like uh, solving problems like this. Um, basically, when I write abstracts, I do it because I'm confident uh, that what I was doing when I wrote the abstract was right. You know, I have a bit of an ego. I think I can tell you exactly what to do. Um, in the six months since then, I've realized that everything I thought was generally useful knowledge when I wrote the abstract was actually kind of wrong. So this talk is going to be a bit more philosophical than the abstract might have implied, but hopefully this, this talk ends up still being uh, useful. So I asked this question incidentally during the, the talk I, I did yesterday. Uh, who here actually unit tests their code? Okay, and most of us will pretend to unit test our code because it's kind of embarrassing uh, when we're in a room full of people who love testing um, to say that you're not unit testing because um, there is this culture around testing that assumes that absolutely everybody writes tests. Um, there are, there are well-known techniques for making your code more testable, for putting test, uh, your code under tests, and people who love testing will spurt self-evident truths that they use to make themselves feel good about themselves when writing these tests. I'm going to include some cat pictures in the next slide so that you can feel the sort of things that testing people want you to feel <laughs> when you see these statements. Uh, so, for example, you should, you should always make sure that your tests don't write to databases because that means you need to set up new databases with every single uh, test run you do, and that's slow. And, you know, your tests should avoid I.O. at all costs because doing I.O. is terrible and it makes your test flaky and non-repeatable. So don't do I.O. And your tests should be really fast so you can run them over and over and over again. Now, each of these generalizations assumes that the way you have structured your code base will enable you to write tests that have those properties. Now, if you don't write tests and you see all of these things and you realize you can't implement tests that have these properties, most people don't go, oh, I'll write tests anyway. Uh, people just don't write tests, and they'll take it as an excuse to never go and write tests. And you know, people will say that you know, things like this, your code is untestable, or your code is... Um... <laughs> Basically, people get motivated to keep not writing tests uh, rather than attempting to actually test things. And the point I want to make today is that if you have any code that can be run at all, there is a way to write tests for it. The tests that you write might not be ideal at all, but they are still tests. They can help you verify and improve your code. And that tests do not need to be perfect to be useful. Um, writing tests for code that wasn't designed to be testable will never resemble what people consider to be good tests, but I hope that I can uh, at least in part to you that you can write bad tests. It will help you improve your code. It will help you to fix bugs. And if you're a testing enthusiast, some of the things I talk about today uh, will make you feel very upset. Get over it. <laughs> 
So how do we make this code that people call testable? Well, one popular way to do it is this test-driven development thing. It's kind of popular at the moment. It normally results in pretty good, quite testable code that has those properties I was discussing earlier. And basically, test-driven development, it's, it's all about doing the bare minimum amount of work to make your tests pass. Um, if your entire requirement set gets specced by tests, then when you have a passing test suite, um, everything or means your code matches your requirements. There are other ways to get testing done early. Um, you can make it a mandatory part of a code review process. I all presume you have code review if you don't do testing. Mm. Um, or making it policy to add new test cases whenever you get bug reports to come in. Uh, either of these are less prone to giving you good test coverage than doing proper test-driven development. And when you're thinking about test-driven development, you generally produce testing in a structured fashion. You start off with unit tests, which are tests for small and isolated parts of a system that can be tested independently. You have lots of them because they tend to be fast. And then you have integration tests that test that all the parts that are under unit testing works together. You generally have fewer of these than you have unit tests because they are slow. And so structured testing under test-driven development looks like this. You write your unit tests first, then you write those units, and then you write the integration tests to make sure they work together. And there's good reasons to write tests early because um, you generally have well-thought-out interfaces that are easier to test. You get interfaces that deal with specific concerns within your system, and um, the concerns are separated so you can mock or write uh, fakes for, for parts of systems that you don't want to test. And, and considering tests early also generally means that you put I.O. away from your business logic. And this is because state tends to lead to isolation issues and I.O. makes tests slow. And people like this test-driven development thing because it's a good way to make sure that you've actually planned out your test plans as soon as your actual code comes into existence. Because you write the tests first, your code is tested when your code exists. The problem with things like this is you get people holding very strongly held opinions. You can tell this is a strongly held opinion because he's capitalized a few words. Um, you know, it's impossible by definition to do test-driven development after the code is written. Um, Statements like this really aren't all that useful, firstly because it suggests that testing is a lost cause on old code bases. Um, I imagine most of you do not get a chance to go and start a new project every single week and most of you would not want to. People have old code that should be tested. Um, Michael Feathers wrote a, uh, a paper back in 2002 and subsequently published a book called Working Effectively with Legacy Code. And very close to the start of that, he points out that most people do not actually ever get to start on Greenfield's code. And he notes that most people who are not working on Greenfield's code leave their code untested and that becomes a maintenance burden into the future. So once you realize that you have this lack of tests, continuing with a lack of tests seems like a pretty bad idea. So the aim should be to transform your code base into one where sometime in the future you have a shot at early stage testing and making it easy to do this early stage testing like test driven development. So adopting this, uh, this test driven development approach isn't immediately possible, um, which means you probably have some code that looks like this. If it's untested, you probably have poor interfaces. So various bits of your code base have to interact with other bits of your code base. Um, you have dependencies tied together, which makes it hard to test different bits in isolation. If your interfaces are poor, it makes it really hard to test specific functions because you have to do lots of setup uh, to get into a single function to actually test it. Uh, if your interfaces are poor, then it may mean that the function that actually has the business logic that you want to test might be four or five layers of function called deep and each of those function calls does more setup to get into the function that you want to test. And more often than not, it's impossible to do these tests without performing I.O. because you put web service calls or whatever at the, um, out of the way of your business logic, or in the way of your business logic, rather. Um, 
And you may have dependencies that are tied together, which makes it, uh, which means that you need to invoke code in bits that you don't really care about testing in order to run the code in the subsystem that you actually want to test. Um, I note uh, in my notes here that dependency injection is kind of the devil in this regard because it makes it very easy to um, apply dependencies that you might not need and you might not have considered in code rather than actually thinking about various interfaces between the bits of your code base. Tying dependencies together is bad for test isolation because you end up having coupled code. And when your code is coupled, this idea of units that arises when you are structured, doing structured testing, these units do not exist because you need well-defined interfaces to have test units. And if you don't have this idea of units, then you can't do integration tests. So this, this standard structured approach to testing, it doesn't really apply. And when people realize that it's hard to easily write these unit tests, most people don't, and this is terrible. So what does this testing strategy look like if you can't adopt um, the unit or integration behavior that test-driven development recommends? If you're repairing old code that doesn't have test coverage, you need to do something different. And once again, uh, Michael Feathers in his paper coined this idea of, of test coverings which is a different way to think about structuring your tests. Rather than thinking about testing units and then testing that those units work well together, he suggests that you just create tests of suites that seek to cover all the code in the part of your system that you're trying to test. There's not much more to it than that. So the idea is that you, you find some sort of interface that can get into the code that you care about fixing Take whatever interface you can, you can use, put it in some sort of test harness and write some test cases that invoke that test harness. Such tests won't give particularly specific information about specific bugs, but it will give you test coverage. So when I talk about creating an interface into the code that you care about, I'm talking about anything that gives you a reasonable amount of isolation into what you're trying to test. And um, when I say okay isolation, I don't mean something that completely does not invoke anything else under your system because you probably can't do that. Um, but if you can minimize the number of side effects you have in other parts of your system when you're uh, testing one section, um, then that's probably okay. If you, can't, if you can't avoid isolating systems, don't don't bother trying to isolate them. That's a waste of time when you can write tests. So the ideal um, interface for testing something is being able to extract just the code you want um, and then wrapping it in some sort of custom testing harness that gets invoked by a test runner. Um, back in 2002, when, um, when working effectively with legacy code was written, he basically implied that you needed to put your code into a custom test harness uh, as opposed to uh, running it in some other um, environment. If your code is easy to extract and put into some other interface, then that might be an achievable thing. Um, if not, um, it might not be pragmatic. If, you've, if you're exposing a web service, put your web service calls inside a test runner and invoke your web service calls or your REST API. If you have the, the bits uh, of a publicly exposed API that exercises the right bit of your code, then just write test cases that exercise that interface. This is a perfectly fine test harness. And if you can't extract a web API and you have you know, HTML inputs and forms, well, WebDriver is a thing. You can use that, you can drive it in Python, and that can hit the, um, hit the public interface to your code, which is a web page that may be fine. If it isolates the right part of your system, then that is a perfectly okay place to start testing. You know, find whatever technology that you can get that will actually let you write the tests that you want and let you write it early. I was asked when I gave this talk last week what you do if you are in a language that's so old that you don't have a test environment. Um, it turns out that most of the time it is possible to still launch executables. So why not test the executable that you produce as a sub-process from within your favorite testing framework? There's bunches of testing frameworks that will produce 
uh, reliable test output that you can put into your continuous integration suite, you know, any Python testing environment, uh, JUnit if you're a Java fan, TAP if you're a Perl user, wrap your executable in it. That's a perfectly fine test environment. So when we're talking about testing at an interface, you may be wondering whether you're dealing with a unit test or an integration test. Well, these don't give you the level of granularity that you would expect from, an, from a unit test. Um, unit tests can us usually be run in complete isolation and give you specific uh, hints as to where your code is broken. Um, when you're testing at an interface with general test cases, looking at a single test case may not actually make sense as far as debugging is concerned. You may need to look at a set of, of tests failing. So what do you get when you're testing a bunch of stuff at the interface? Well, from first principles, you get invariance in your system. Invariance are these fixed observed properties that you get out of unit tests. Um, when you're unit testing, a single passing test case is an invariant. You know that it's an observed property of your system because you've said that that's what your system is going to do. Now, when you have these invariants, you can refactor code around that because you can tell if the behavior has changed when you change the code. Establishing any invariance means that you can refactor with some level of impunity. And these only exist in code that you've put under test. So if you're writing unit tests in a structured fashion, you can generally tell what sort of thing has failed and you can tell exactly how you made it fail because you're testing a small and isolated part of your system. So you can make assertions like uh, reverse string works with an empty string you're testing a single function under a single property. And you can tell it with some level of precision. Make your test at the interface. Um, if that fails, you get useful information, which is that a test has failed. But if you've got several layers of, of interdependent code before you get to the part that you're actually trying to test, you can't tell where in the, code, in the code path your test has failed because there might be bits adding in useful, um, irrelevant bits of information. So generally analyzing multiple failing tests that touch similar code paths are likely to reveal causes of failure. So this suggests that it's often a, a good idea to adopt an approach where you have lots of tests that, where the lines that, that comprise your code don't change, but your input data does. So sort of using parametric type tests where you have lots and lots of test data as opposed to lots of test functions. Uh, writing functions takes effort. Writing data tends not to. So even if you don't get these tests uh, that tell you sort of direct and fine-grained results about, uh, about where your code is failing, you still get tests out of this, and that's a good thing and you shouldn't be unhappy with the fact that your tests aren't quite what you want yet. Uh, getting tests is more important than, than getting good tests to start off with. So it's also vital to know what sort of code is actually being covered by these test cases that you create, because this is how you can justifiably refactor. Knowing which parts of your code base is covered under testing, super important. So, this is a function here. It has basically a single path through it. Um, if you have simple line coverage when you're doing your, your test analysis, you can sort of broadly see which bits of code need to work, uh, need work when you're adding tests. Um, getting big gains on lines covered, though, is quite easy. Um, this function has minimal branching, so you can get all six lines by writing a single test case. But instead, what if you were looking at branches coverage? We have two six-line functions here. The top one, it needs four test cases in order to get 100% line coverage, or branch coverage, rather. And this one only needs one test to get full line coverage. You need to write five tests to get full branch coverage in this case. So testing branches in this case, or looking at branch coverage, actually indicates the amount of effort towards getting full coverage, whereas you can get easy gains if you're doing line coverage. Use a metric that tells you how much effort is required to fully cover your code base so you can measure your progress. And 
testing lines of code coverage is probably not it. So testing an entire system is kind of terrible because you need to do lots of setup, code is complicated to write, tests are imprecise and slow. So let's talk about how to make these actually bearable. So if you have I.O. and statefulness embedded in the interface that you're testing, it's difficult to get rid of it. Um, usual techniques like mocking, uh, writing fakes, stuff like that, these only apply if you can pull out useful interfaces for the bits of the code that you want to mock or fake. Um, that will generally involve a refactor. It makes a lot more sense to actually write tests before you go and refactor. The problem is that this I.O. tends to make your tests very slow and when you're working to refactor a system, you want to make the tests you've written actually accessible. If your tests require you to actually go out and do I.O., um, then it's likely that a large amount of your test time is going to be doing setup, teardowns of, of various bits of your system. Doing setup and teardown after every case um, is necessary to maintain complete isolation, but this comes at the expense of making your test suite slow. And slow test suites are a massive inconvenience to the people who are running the test suites. And if they're too slow, they tend to get neglected. Um, if you try to speed them up at the, uh, at, the, at the expense of correctness, these are likely to create further issues down the track from chasing down non-existent bugs. So how do you deal with this? Measure everything. Know exactly what time is being spent in your test suite. Know where time is being wasted during setup time and teardown time so you can figure out where you can save time in exchange for absolute correctness for every single test case. Once you've done that, you can look for tests that don't impede each other within the same test environment. So cluster tests that are unrelated and dealing with unrelated parts of your system. And this will obviate the need for isolation and sanitization of your test environment. So what you get is local isolation for each test case. Um, and that means you can run them in the same environment without hurting your overall correctness. And to verify that you have clustered your test cases correctly, um, run each test case in different random orders each time so you can check to see if there are any accidental dependencies between your test cases. This will verify that the tests aren't actually dependent on each other. Um, you should also, if you've got time to do nightly builds, and you probably should, people aren't, don't tend to be awake during the night, run your test cases thoroughly with setups and teardowns on each test case with full sanitization to see whether or not they function uh, in a completely sa um, sanitized environment. The approach that I suggest though, this, this yields slow, non-specific and cumbersome tests to write. So this should not be used as a long-term testing strategy. If you get these tests and they break you know that overall behavior in your system has changed. You've introduced a regression somewhere, but it's very hard to tell where you've introduced your regressions. So you can use these tests as a way to check if overall behavior has changed as you change your structure. But using this as an overall testing strategy is only gonna be difficult for the people maintaining your code into the future. So with that in mind, let's talk about how to refactor, and this is the one thing that I've learned that I think is actually concrete when dealing with, uh, with problems like this. Because refactoring your, your code, oh sorry, having interface tests means that you can refactor your code with impunity. And this strategy I think tends to work quite well. Um, this is a terrible architecture diagram from a person called Uncle Bob. He's apparently quite big in the software architecture community. And he describes this thing called the clean architecture. It has a nice name, which must mean he really likes it. Um, this describes systems where you put external code, frameworks, I.O., stuff that you're likely to replace on a frequent basis and doesn't, um, that doesn't relate to your business logic on the outside and putting your business logic on the inside. And it defines this thing called the dependency rule. 
which says that any of the layers towards the center of this core aren't allowed to know anything at all about the bits on the outside. Um, Brandon Rhodes gave a talk at Pi Ohio last year, which I strongly recommend you look at. It's called The Clean Architecture in Python. It gives a nice, simple example of how this works in practice. This shows you the wrong way of refactoring a, um, a piece of functionality out of a broader function. It's pulling a, an I.O. call out of a broader method and leaving the processing code, the important business logic, in the outer layer. And if you're going to put this set of code under testing, you need to do some level of dependency injection or mocking of this call JSON API function in order to be able to test the business logic at all. Um, so you'd need to write something that pretends to do this call JSON API thing um, in order to actually run it under test without invoking I.O. The alternative is to leave the I.O. bound functions at the top and pull out the processing code into functions. So this build URL thing was at the top of the previous slide and, and the pluck definition was at the bottom of the function at the top. These processing functions, provided you can set up this data that is expected, it, it's really, really easy to test these in isolation. You just, you don't need to test the top one at all in a unit testing context. Gary Bernhard gave a talk at PyCon 2013 in the US, and in that talk called Boundaries, um, he firstly gave the clean architecture a much cooler name. He called it Functional Core Imperative Shell, and that's good because it actually describes what you're doing in it. Um, basically, he talked about using this approach to think about how you can structure your code to minimize the amount of mocking or faking you need to do when you're writing tests. Basically, produce your processing function, or your processing logic as pure functions and isolate the I.O. as close to the top as you can. And if your core processing logic is purely functional, it has no I.O. or anything like that, then you can unit test these bits thoroughly and those tests will run quickly. And the integration tests, testing this so-called imperative shell, these are just the tests that execute at the top level of your system, where the I.O. potentially happens. You have relatively few of these tests, and you only need to mock or fake or test under I.O. at a relatively centralized and isolated point of your system. That is, the bits that call your I.O. functions. Now, the core observation with this, though, is that this approach, as well as being an overall initial architectural decision you could make, actually works surprisingly well as a local refactoring strategy. Any function that calls I.O. gets integration tested. Any function that doesn't gets unit tested. So if you want to increase your unit test coverage, it's just a matter of refactoring such that you're pulling out the purely functional, side effect free bits of your functions. And then you can get unit testable code. So how do you do this at smaller scales? You find the processing routines that are inside your bigger functions, factor these out into bits where you can define the interfaces clearly and put tests around them, and factor out inner loops so you can test these things, uh, that these behave correctly en masse. And if you concentrate on keeping your I.O. at towards the top in relatively few functions, then you can test those in integration test fashion and factor the fast codes into their own functions for unit testing. So go and write those tests. The emergent functions are effectively the units that structured testing describes. And once you've done that, suddenly the tests that you wrote to start off with, uh, to start off, become integration tests, sort of like magic. If you take unstructured testing seriously, you will eventually accidentally start doing structured testing. And that will eventually lead to good code coverage. So I end this talk with a, a short discussion of actually tracking down bugs in your code. Firstly, consider how your code might be invoked in production by a user. Can you, can you reproduce um, an invocation of how your code exists in prod inside your test harnesses. 
Um, if so, then it means you can capture every bug report at the interface as a test and then spot regressions in previous bug reports as they arise. Um, you should focus on creating test cases as data as opposed to as code because it's really hard to write to set up complex interfaces frequently, whereas data is a lot easier to reproduce. It's faster to write than extra code. And whilst these tests can be slow and cumbersome and you don't nearly need as many of them as you might need to start off with later on once you start refactoring, keeping them around and running them regularly is important. Maybe run them nightly instead of continuously. So in conclusion, I wrote the abstract for this talk six months ago whilst undertaking a massive refactor. And what I've kind of learnt from this is that nobody's specific advice ever applies to refactoring this, uh, refactoring your code. Not every technique I've described here might work in your situation, but you might get lucky. And so when people talk about doing test-driven development where you start by writing unit tests and then writing units and then testing your end-to-end -end functionality and telling you that's the only way to go about testing your code, perhaps you can think about it in reverse. Write your integration tests first, refactor those into units and then write your unit tests. You get tests, you end up with unit tests and something that looks like structured testing and it means you can fix your code. So it's not impossible by definition to practice test-driven development on existing code. You just need to get to the point where you can start writing tests on your new code. And that's the end. I've run a bit under time, uh, so I think that means we have plenty of time for questions. I will also take comments and war stories if you've done stuff like this yourself. Um, we have discussion time, I guess. Yes. Thank you. Great talk. Thanks. Um, I, I watched the video from PyCon as well, the clean code stuff that looks very interesting to me. Um, a quick war story. I have a very similar approach to you on solving this sort of problem, mm -hmm. but I generally take the approach of if I can, if it's not tested, I will just write tests when something breaks. Right. Um, that's normally when these sorts of things come into existence. I mean, most people don't realize there's a problem until a problem comes into existence. Then it's a matter of reproducing it. You can either find somebody and pay them to reproduce the test every single time or the failure every single time uh, you make changes to the code, or you can spend a few days actually implementing tests on it, and then it's reproducible every single time, and that's really important. It means your regressions keep, keep on getting spotted, and that's the point of, of writing tests. You should do it. Yeah? You've ruined me just asking a, asking a comment, so I'll ask an actual question. Oh, <laughs> um, this is good. My <laughs> reverse psychology worked. Uh, we do a lot of embedded development, mm -hmm. and finding ways of doing test cases is quite difficult because it's very event-driven and sporadic, and there's race conditions. Do you have any ideas on the best way to do that sort of thing? Um, Running tests multiple times, uh, running entire suite multiple times to check for um, sort of flaky tests being flaky as opposed to being actual failures can often help. Um, Sorry, and also, the, also the, the difficulty with being on a different platform and you can't necessarily run the tests on that platform. Right, so if you have some sort of public interface to your thing, uh, be it a web API or be it talking via serial or something like that. If you have an interface, then you can invoke it from a language which has a testing framework. Um, if you are a fan of writing stuff in Python, well, use a Python testing framework and use that to talk to your devices. If It's just a matter of having some sort of interface that can talk to the thing that you want to run under tests. Um, like, there's no reason why you have to execute your tests or define your test cases on the same platform as you're running them, especially if there isn't a test environment. Because if you think having no test environment in my, in my um, development environment means I can't write tests, then you're, then you're never going to get tests.
that if your code can run, run your code. Uh, I think, oh, Katie, you had a question or? Hi. Hi. What is your opinion about 100% complete test coverage? On existing, on existing code bases, it's basically impossible. And there are reasons for this, and it generally involves people being overcautious with error handling. Um, why are people overcautious with error handling on code that hasn't been tested? I wonder why. <laughs> um, you will generally find when you start writing tests on code that hasn't previously been tested, there are unreasonable error handling cases, and generally those error handling cases can be deleted once you realize they're not actually important to anything. Deleting code that will never actually get hit um, is a perfectly valid way to get 100% test coverage. <laughs> Graham? Yeah, good talk. This is a follow-up to the previous question. Um, in terms of embedded unit testing where you don't have much control over the embedded device, We've done things in the past where it's almost a black box that someone's given us and said test it, mm -hmm. and there is no public interface. Web cameras with OCR, brute force like that, or wire logic analyzers in, and a logic analyzer you can actually hook into your unit tests. Two ways of cheating, if that helps. So the point to be made is that if your system is observable, then you can test it. Um, Bad interfaces can get in the way of making tests easy, but if there is an interface at all, you can put it under tests. Yes. Hi. Yeah. Hey. Thanks. Thanks for the talk. Uh, two references to books. Yes. Um, on that topic, uh, Martin Fowler's Refactoring is a good one, mm -hmm. and X Unit Test Patterns is also a good one, especially if you deal with um, with uh, existing uh, test um, infrastructure, which really is coupled to data or mm -hmm. runs for ages, great way to yeah, dig, your, dig yourself out. Cool, thanks for that. Um, I also want to plug Michael Feather's book, uh, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. Um, it talks about this, even though the approaches are a bit dated these days. Uh, there's a question over here, so let's... Oh, wait, there's one over there as well. Let's take you first. Um, yes, I just have a quick comment. So, oh, excellent. Um, you mentioned that uh, when you were talking about invariance um, and the fact yes. that a test case is an invariant, um, often your test case will actually be a specialization of a more general invariant or law. So you can uh, have a look at some options for randomized testing or exhaustive testing of those functions. Um, yes, and that's a perfectly good way to create extra test data. Like I said, data is easy to generate, code isn't. Random, uh, creating random test cases is a perfectly good way to create extra data. Yep, um, is there, yep. Um, one of your slides was uh, bad tests are better than no tests. Um, just wondering, what, what is your definition of bad? Because my definition of bad is something that doesn't state the, um, the intention of the code, um, whereas you might have a different de definition? I would say bad, well, that is actually a, a really good example and, uh, of, of what I mean. Um, something which doesn't say what you are trying to test specifically is a, is a bad test, but you can still write and it will tell you something about your system. Um, and knowing something about your system that you can establish as something that doesn't change is better than having no thing that says anything about your system. But yeah, bad tests are things that don't give you good information or good, accurate, concise information about what is passing, what is failing. Uh, I think we had one over here. Well, thank you for the talk. That was quite interesting. And I myself write or do test-driven development. But mm -hmm. uh, so you made a recommendation that we should keep as many test cases as possible, but mm -hmm. at the same time, like test cases often go stale. So what do you think? Right, um, obviously as you refactor things, um, interfaces that you previously had might, might cease to exist. Um, tests might start overlapping. Um, use your judgment to figure out what test cases are still relevant. Um, but you should aim to keep as many of them as you can. Uh, because more tests are better than, than fewer tests. 
as long as they're still accurate. But, yeah. you know, get rid of them if they're no longer relevant. Yeah, yeah. I guess the last year there was a kind of controversy that TDD is dead now. <laughs> uh, I guess you're familiar with the blog article in this one. I know people who still do it and people who still love it, and that means it's pretty much alive. <laughs> Thank you. Not a problem. Uh, do we have any more questions? I think we've probably got time for one more if there is anyone. Yeah, there's one up the front here. Sorry. <laughs> I just wondered if you could expand a little bit more on the data-driven testing as opposed to the um, code-driven testing. Because I've, I've, I've come across situations where the tests contain a wall of lists of data or dicts or whatever, mm -hmm. and it becomes very difficult to read and deal with when something goes wrong often because you you know the data is somewhere in this big you know um, how, do, how do you generate what are you talking okay about there? Um, like I said this talk was inspired by work in Java um, so I will refer to JUnit here um, there's a parameterization system within JUnit which allows you to specify data that goes into each um, into each test case in a parameterized system and you can basically present a the title of your test as being the data you pass into it. Generating individual test cases for each piece of data is paramount because it means you can see each of them failing independently and make sure that your tests describe the data that is being pushed in. Gen uh, if your system can generate test cases on that in, in a way similar to that, it makes it really easy to infer what sort of things are failing. I think I'm Robert... Hypothesis. Sorry? Hypothesis does that in Python? Well, it's the quick check in Python is magic. Great. Um, Robert says hypothesis is a thing, and I'm sorry my s laptop just went to sleep. Hope that hasn't broken the AV stuff. Um, yeah, so I think, that's, I think that's all the time we have. Yeah, is that's it? all yeah. we have time for. So thank you very much, Chris. Great, thank you.